everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dan Dawson Show. So today I have Daniel, doc, Dr. Daniel Rybicki. Very good guy, known him for a while. We, we train together, we shoot together. Uh, he's, he was the forensic psychologist for the Los Angeles Police Department. Has a lot of interesting takes on life. And we were just talking actually before the show and I learned so much about him. That, you know how when you meet a kindred spirit and you don't quite know why, but you kind of connect. And so we were talking about how we grew up. Uh, so Dr. Dan, which is what we, we call him, we call him Dr. Dan. So <laughs> all you in the audience, please feel free, I guess, to call him Dr. Dan. Absolutely. But, so if you could tell us a little bit about how you grew up and um, the circumstances that led to you doing what you do. Yeah, well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, first of all, and I'm really glad to support what you're doing. I think more that we can get good information out to people to get them thinking about different things that they might not otherwise have thought about, um, get them looking at uh, resources in themselves and uh, things they can share with one another. Awesome stuff. So I'm really pleased to be here, number one. Um, and yeah, I, I recognize you as a kindred spirit, too, right off. Uh, when we've done our work together with training and shooting and such, I can see that we have um, a sense of humor that we both share, uh, <laughs> which is contagious. That's, uh, that's built from years in the mental health field. <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely, exactly. And, and, as, and as a way of being able to cope with life and all of its challenges. So true. before the show, we were talking a little bit, and I, I think we have all kinds of topics that we could discuss in, in weeks to come. But I was telling you a little bit about, you know me now as a man of, of my age, um, I'm in my, my semi-retirement years, but I took you clear back to when I was a little kid growing up in Southern California in a wealthy community that I lived on the outskirts of. Um, and I had my JCPenney jeans uh, baggy that when the knees got torn out because you skidded too many oftentimes, you know, you got to wear those with some new patches put on them. <laughs> so, <Yes. laughs> So growing up like that and, and realizing that the kids that I grew up with, while they came from you know, more financially stable backgrounds, they didn't necessarily have happiness. And I had the benefit of a grandfather who really grew up with the, what he said was the school of hard knocks. Um, and he taught me a lot of really valuable life lessons about really trying to build a life that had meaning and purpose um, that I could feel comfortable with. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll kind of put a benchmark on both of this. I remember when I got to high school age and I said to myself, I want to be an old man one day, sitting on my front porch with my spouse sitting next to me, looking back on a life where I've traveled a lot of places, ate a lot of good food, made a lot of nice friends, seen all kinds of things that are important and valuable in the world, and had a good sense of peace about where I've been and what I've done. And, and you know what? I've been there. I, I feel I've achieved that. So well, see, and that's the thing, that's something that in the conversation before we didn't even touch on, but your grandfather was the influential male figure. My grandfather was also the same. My grandfather was born in 1900, and I, I, I remember I went home here a few years ago, and uh, so every time I go home, I go clean off my grandparents' graves, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, I have seven little brothers and sisters, right? Mm. And so the younger ones, because they're the much younger ones, I mean, just getting into their 30s, and I'm almost 50, so if that tells you anything, parents renewed that love, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, they were like, we don't even know where Grandpa's grave is. And so my mom goes, well, you have to understand, he raised Dan, and I was raised with those 1900s values. Yes. Love your country. You work hard. Uh, um, you value friendship and people over money and things. Yeah. And, yeah. and I kind of look at society, you know, we were talking about, the, you know, I was telling you about my Walmart jeans, where you got three pair of jeans for the year, and that's what, that's just what you got. And you have to make do with it. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it teaches you to overcome, but I'm not saying that much in today's society. No, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that, and I, and I think that's part that we both share. You got that from your grandfather, who was that primary role, male role figure, and, and, and for me, the same thing. Um, he was from uh, 1898, so a couple years different than your granddad. Um, and learning what I did from him um, about what he used to say was the value of a dollar, 
Uh, and that really was basically learning how to take care of yourself and earn and take care of those things that you spent that money on. He would say, spend it wisely. And so that was one of a hundred different sayings he had. But growing up from that, that kind of experience, I worked hard throughout high school. Um, I got involved with speech and debate. Um, I was manager of several football teams and basketball teams and whatnot. And I thought I was gonna be an attorney. And lo and behold, I got to college and uh, my sweetheart at the time, a major first girlfriend, had a good insight that I would not be happy as an attorney. And I started taking a psychology class and fell in love with psychology. Next thing you know, I double majored in psychology, basically, took twice as many classes, graduated number two in my class from the Claremont Men's College at the time, and got into graduate school at the University of Illinois in Champaign, where I was part of the first American Psychological Association approved um, PsyD Doctor of Psychology program. And so I was really blessed to be there. If it hadn't been for scholarships and hard work and working outside of school and part-time jobs, I wouldn't have gotten there. So I was always one of, um, you know, I'm gonna work hard to get someplace. And when I've earned it, then it's mine and I can feel confident in it. And I, I was telling you before the show about uh, psychologist Albert Bandura, who was a psychologist uh, at Stanford University. And he had a concept called self-efficacy, like to be efficacious, to have the efficiency and capacity to do something. And he basically pointed out that self-esteem isn't based on um, all the accolades you get from others. It's not based on the prizes and awards and attaboys. Yeah, those are all nice, but it's based on the knowledge that you have the capacity to do something. You have a skill set. You have the ability to self-regulate, self-manage, take care of yourself. And, and when you have that capacity, you feel confident in yourself. And so I, I gained some of those things over the years, whether it was learning different kinds of skills and abilities, which helped me get through graduate school. Um, and so I think that what you were talking about in part was too many people these days aren't taught the kinds of values that you and I were taught. They are given, and unfortunately my profession has done so much to screw up kids, um, I can't even begin to explain. They've, they've gone down the wrong path in terms of treating them as if they couldn't handle anything um, when actually they need to be inculcated against stress, inoculated, if you will, stress inoculation, building up strength, resistance, capacity, self-regulation, managing your own behavior, paying attention and making good choices. All that is the good part that my profession worked on. But it gets lost when we go into, oh, you can't say that because you're going to hurt some little kid's feelings. Um, you can't possibly give an award because everyone's going to feel bad. So they have to all get trophies. The, the real world isn't like that. And so um, when I look at my life, I'm glad for the mishaps and misgivings that took place. They were lessons learned and a chance to be able to do things differently. And, and it sounds like you've come from the same background as well. Well, you would not imagine how much because in high school, I also did speech and debate. <laughs> I also wanted to be an attorney. And so, and I also eventually, of course, got into mental health. So it's like we're running this parallel path. So I understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. And if you look at the society we have today, and uh, I did a video, video on the Dan Dawson show a little while ago about and I just woke up one morning and I'm uh, uh, looking through the articles and I see this wall of moms article, right? Like, come stand behind me. This mom will protect you. No, you're out riding. <laughs> you're breaking the law. And I don't know about your grandpa, but you know, old men back in the days, they had an, and we're talking about, when you talk about 1898, 1900, you're talking yeah. about the old West. <laughs> You're talking to, because the men who raised them were born in the middle of the old West. And it's that mentality of if you do something, you have responsibility for it. Right. And I, I think responsibility has been lost in a lot of society. I, I look out now, like I look at these Portland riots and people aren't being charged and, and it's like a loss of responsibility. And you're absolutely right. We have hurt our kids. And I blame Dr. Spock. Yeah, I think you're totally right about that. I, I, I'm so concerned that my profession has done so much to, to weaken the family, and our politics has weakened the family, whether it's a black family, uh, you know, any Absolutely family. Absolutely agree. 
when you when you knock out the family, when you knock out people's faith, whatever it may be, when you knock out their capacity to have self-reliance and to feel responsible for themselves, and we may not have much, but we're proud of what we got kind of attitude. When you take that away and you make people beholden, you really are, are dampening the human spirit in a way that's just criminal in my mind. And I think we're seeing the outcome of that these days. I very much agree with you. Even if you look at like, um, I have black friends, of course. <laughs> but I do too. They support like BLM, right? But they support, well, and I have white friends who support BLM, right? With some craziness. But their first, if you go to their website, one of the first things they say is they want to get rid of the nuclear family. They want to end the patriarchy or patriarchy in, um, in households. But like me and you were just discussing, the most influential people in our lives were our grandfathers. Yeah. And it's not like they were, like, I don't know about your grandfather. My grandfather was not a hardcore man because I lived in the house. My parents owned a restaurant. I spent all my time with my grandparents because you know how restaurants go. <laughs> but I saw what went on outside the house. Yeah, it was his word and his word is law. Inside the house, my grandmother ran the house. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so I don't think they really understand it. And I'm wondering if, since the 60s and 70s, that entire generation that has grown up without a positive male figure in the house yeah. has kind of lost those values. Because back in the day, I, I watched this. Have you seen the Gillette video uh, with the, the anti-masculinity video? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Where the two little boys are fighting. And what struck me is one of my best friends, and he died in a car accident a few years ago, uh, Travis Kaczmarski, great guy. We met when he first came to the school and we got in a fight on the football field. But we had respect for each other because he came in, like you said, you were, he was a smaller guy. I was one of the biggest guys on the football field. So he went after me. I'm like, dude, why are you going after me? I don't want to be. <laughs> and so we went at it and we boxed a little bit and we became best of friends and we remained friends. Matter of fact, I talked to him a couple of days before he passed uh, in, you know, in a car wreck. But I don't think that mentality is there anymore. The re not so much the whole fighting part, but the respect part. Well, you know, I think that, that from my end, um, even though my granddad was a major uh, kind of male role model for me, I had a stepdad, I had my biological dad, they were very different kind of people. Um, but my mom really ran our household in that sense. And <laughs> what was interesting was, I think because I grew up with that, I'm a different man than a lot of folks from the standpoint that, um, and you, probably the same thing in mental health, very comfortable with women, very comfortable with feelings, very comfortable with, if I got to do the dishes, I'm doing the dishes. We, we share responsibilities. We are I just partners. did the dishes yesterday. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so the point is that the, it, it wasn't a um, up, down, superior kind of thing. It was really more of teamwork, uh, ownership together, responsibility together. And, and that's what I was striving for in my marriage. And I tell you, I celebrated 24 years of marriage, so blessed with this wonderful woman um, and, and could go on you know, lengthy about that. But <laughs> she, she recognizes that that growing up with my mom was influential in a lot of things. Um, influences how I dress, influences how I see things, the fact that we talk things out in an emotional way as well. So I'm, I'm pleased that I've had both of those kinds of experiences. And for me, what's really been interesting, this a whole other end of the story, is that probably in these last five years where I've gotten into much more of the work we do with firearms and tactical weapons and such and, and training, um, I have found my warrior spirit come forth. It was my warrior spirit was part of me when I was wanting to be an attorney. I, I was looking at people like Clarence Darrow, attorney for the damned. I wanted to be out there as a defense attorney and then got in psychology and ended up feeling, OK, I can still be an attorney with my psychology background. Next thing you know, I'm doing psychology and benefiting a lot of people that way. And and all that was good, but it didn't quite have some of that um, so I've always worked on behalf of, of folks that needed help, whether it was child abuse, kids in trouble, families in, in dysfunction, what have you. And I found myself in the forensic world that we can talk about in just a second. But I found amongst the people I train with now that I've developed more um, self-reliance and survival skills, greater um, combat skills, if you will, hand-to-hand -hand defense and things of that nature. 
And I've tapped into that warrior masculinity side now in a way in my latter years that was part obviously of what I need to do in this lifetime. And so I'm thankful for that and for sharing that with people like you. Well, and that's, that's the thing. I was growing up black in the deep South, you know, I grew up in South Texas. I was raised pretty much by all women. Grandfather was a major figure, but when it came down to it, the grandmothers ran the house, mama ran the house. I have five sisters. They pretty much run everything. Matter of fact, if you go back on my personal Facebook, there's a picture of us, right? And it's all eight of us, the three boys and the five girls, right? And somebody's like, oh, da, 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 beautiful family. I'm like, no, it's not. Those five in the front are the bosses. We just do what they say. <laughs> it, it, and it goes back to that. It doesn't mean you're less masculine. No. As a matter of fact, it makes you more masculine. And I think, honestly, when I entered the, as I got older and I entered the dating world, it gave me an advantage because mm -hmm. I knew, understood, and knew how to talk to women. Right. But um, no, what you're saying is absolutely, absolutely on point. It changes your perspective. And I'm, I'm seeing that we grew up a lot of the same way. Grandpa presented an image. My grandfather was a big man. He was 6'4". My grandfather got cancer, mm. lost 40 pounds, and wasted mm. down to 260. Mm. He was, you know, because the old man, they worked in the fields every day, and that's what they did. So he was a humongous man. But he was a titty bear when it came to my grandmother, who was, all the girls are about five foot. <laughs> right so and she was my grandmother was maybe four eight but she ran the house and so it gives you that which you know it, it determines what you your your lifestyle how you grew up determines what you look for in a relationship and always looked for that and it was hey when we're in the house you're the boss we step out the, out the house if something happens stand behind me i got it and it helps with your developing your masculinity when you can find a partner who understands and relates to that. And I think the problem, we're, we're both lucky, right? Yes. <laughs> we're yes. both yes. very lucky because a lot of women don't get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you're hitting upon there is the fact that, that it, you can be strongly masculine, you can do what you need to in that role, and you can still be warm and caring and affectionate and nurturing, all those good things. Um, you, can, you can make a partnership. And so over the years, after I got through graduate school, I was trained in uh, a lot of marriage and family therapy. I worked with eating disorder patients for quite a few years, published in the area. Um, I taught at graduate schools, quite a few different psychology programs across the country. Um, I've served on editorial board, boards for journals, done my own research and other writings. And I, I found it was really interesting. I thought I was going to be an attorney. I ended up in the psychology world. The next thing you know, I became a forensic psychologist. So I was able to come back to apply psychology in the world of the, of the law and do a lot of family law related work and then found myself because of things going on, uh, working for about 11 years with the city of LA and LAPD and police psychology. So I got much more exposed to law enforcement issues um, and then came and moved to different locations from California up here to Washington and have continued the forensic work. So it's been a really interesting journey that way. A lot of different hats. Can I ask you something about the whole law enforcement part of it? Sure. Because I know when I was bounty hunting, even when I worked at my former job at the psych hospital, uh, when you walk in as a, as a big dude, you have to put on this like Superman cape. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that made me feel good is when I walk through the front door of my house, I can drop the cape. Uh -huh. I don't right. want to wear the cape anymore. I can drop it. And like you were saying, you can touch into that, the Philly side, because out there, when you're doing that, you're doing the bounty hunting, you can't really have that too much. Right. You have to put on that mask. So maybe that's a better way to describe it. You could take off the mask. Did you find that with a lot of police officers? Well, well my role uh, in large part, I was doing pre-employment psychological screening. So our task was to weed out those folks that we could predict wouldn't be good police officers. You can't really predict in, but we could work to screen out and disqualify them. And so by the time they got to us, they'd gone through a lot of hoops already, background checks and physicals and so on. They were just about to get ready to get selected. Um, and so I did pre-employment. Pre I did work fitness. 
in terms of law enforcement officers that were involved in critical incidents, officer involved shootings. And we would do assessments of when they were ready to go back to be sure they weren't carrying a lot of scars from that experience. Um, and then I did critical stress, critical incident stress debriefing, uh, being able to help people work through bad things that have happened. I did a fair number of ride-alongs and I could see that a lot of officers struggled with what you just said, having to maintain a certain persona, having a hard time setting that aside when they get home to be a more balanced person. Um, you know, being a cop, they, they live at 24 seven and it's a tough, tough world for them. So it does, it does a lot of damage in terms of alcoholism, um, damaged marriages, impairment with their relationship with their kids, all of which I was working with in my private practice world with child custody and divorce issues and substance use. Um, so those, it's it, being able to set that aside like you're able to, to take that mask off when you get home, really, really crucial. Um, it allows both sides of you to be present for the people that you love. Well, for me, it was a joy to be able to take it off, but something you just touched on, right? The, um, uh, the old lady, her first cousin, her uncle's son, is a cop down in Florida. He works 12 hour shifts. Yeah. So I, I called him one day, I'm talking to him. He's like, oh man, I'm on second shift. I'm like, oh, you're working swings. And he goes, no, I'm doing it. I, I have to do a double because we're short. I'm like, well, hold up. You do 12 hour shifts. So this guy is running 24 hours. Yeah. And then maybe sleeping for four, then getting up and doing it again. Right. You know, that's really a lot. I don't think people realize the amount of mental stress, seeing the worst. And you're, you're a psychologist, you know the deal. Seeing the worst of the worst of society every day and hearing all these horrible stories what it does to a person, because the human mind, honestly, some of the things you hear, uh, the, the mind can't take. I developed, oh, I developed a thing here a few years ago where uh, for my mentally ill patients, I don't read the history. Because sometimes the history is so horrific. Mm -hmm. You know, what they've done out of their mental illness that I really fear that I can't, or I feared I'm not there anymore but I feared that I couldn't treat them like people. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to take that part away. It's a lot of little steps in there where if you want to be effective, especially in policing, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to be able to relate to people. When we talk about the tough world the police officers go through, it really is difficult. The levels of stress, not only the stress they're dealing with in terms of long hours, uh, life and death situations, seeing people at their worst day in and day out, horrible tragic situations, and then add on top of that, the political stresses within an organization that may not support them, may not give them the resources they need. For instance, I, I just heard today, I listened to a radio program um, about in Seattle, the, uh, there's a, a support group that's putting money together for the Seattle PD to be able to buy them the necessary um, eye protections so that when the protesters are shining these lasers that can cause lifelong damage and or blindness, provide them, it costs 60 bucks for the protective goggles. The PD isn't providing it, this organization is. So there's donations being collected for that. You know, when, when an officer is dealing with a, a, a systemic issue where they're not getting the support for their job from the politics and the, the political organization, um, they get it from both ends, which is why Suicide rates can be high for police officers, alcoholism and such. So uh, we were also working with people providing those kinds of help and treatment. Well, you know, alcoholism is, and suicide rates and divorce rates are often very high. And, and you know, when you're, you're talking about the police, I don't think people realize the hard job they do. So to constantly, and I think people look at the police as a statue, like they're not human. But you know, bounty hunting, I've worked with plenty of officers, Lakewood, Auburn, Kent, worked all around the area with these guys, right? Cool guys, good guys. But the amount of stress they deal with, and you know, when you think about, you may go to work, I don't think most people contemplate this in their mind. You could go to work with your vision today and be blind by the end of your shift. Right. Or what well, you see in Seattle now, they're throwing explosives at cops. Mm -hmm. Do you see the, I, I saw this uh, YouTube post where the cops are getting hit by these explosives and they're missing chunks out their necks and their faces. Right. 
And so it, it comes to a point to what do you expect cops to do? I'm sitting back and being a black man, my, you know, my thoughts on the whole George Floyd thing are, oh, well, I, I hate to say it like that, but <laughs> that's just where I am. Because I saw the police cam video. Right. As soon as they walk up to the S to his truck, to his SUV with four other people, and he's already saying, I can't breathe. And they're trying to put him in the police car. And he yes. said, put me on the ground. Yes. And that and the police officer that ended up with his knee on his neck, they didn't like each other anyway. They worked together. They didn't like each other. Right. And it's like, I, I, I kind of commiserate with what the cops were saying. Well, you're highlighting important elements of that history which haven't been shared in the media. Um, and there's pretty strong suggestions that um, what they were looking at in part was amphetamine-related kinds of respiratory problems, um, hyped up in such a way that he couldn't breathe even before the neck issue started. Um, there's a lot of history and detail that get left out there. I'm, I'm always one of those people that I don't care what color somebody is, I don't care their nationality, their background, I try to meet them like you said with your patients as people. Which, so moving from my work in the law enforcement area to the forensic work, you know, a lot of people think forensic psychology would be that you're dealing with psychology of dead people. No, it's not psychology of dead people. <laughs> it's the legal application. So in my world there, I've seen all kinds of things. I've, I've done over 450 full psychological parenting evaluations Ooh. where the question was, who's going to be the primary parent? What kind of parenting plan is going to be done? I've done 8,000 psychological assessments uh, with different psychological instruments, being able to look at everything from inpatient psychotic individuals to just, you know, average situation where people are in therapy. Um, and I've seen all kinds of situations, but I've always tried to hang on to the solid view that there's a person in there, no matter what their background's been, no matter how crazy they are, and now I'm going to be alert. I'm not going to be foolish about boundaries and safety and protection issues. But um, I've always wanted to be the kind of person that shows some respect to a person. And, and it's that communication of respect and acceptance at that first, I'm going to take you at face value until I see otherwise, that I think makes a huge, huge difference. And I, I'm, I'm really glad that you chose that word a little earlier. Well, the, uh, I had a one-to-one -one patient, right? Uh, very assaultive. I think in the three years he was there, he had over 2,500 assaults. So they gave him to me, or they sent him to our ward. I said, hey, I'll do one-to-one -one, because I'm the big guy. I do one-to-one, -one, right? So I worked with him for four years. Got dis He got discharged. But in those four years, he never attacked me, not one time. Right. And so my RN was saying, oh, yeah, I asked him. He goes, I was like, did you? Did you not attack Dan? Because, you know, I'm not really that big. I'm six foot two twenty. That's not that big, right? And he goes, no, I didn't attack Dan because he's big. I didn't attack Dan because Dan respected me. He talked to me like a man. Because what I find that goes on a lot, especially at mental hospitals, with people who aren't trained, they come in and they start talking to the patients like they're children. Right. And to a grown man, that's very disrespectful. But with my client, it was like, I'm going to tell you what it is, and we're going to talk like men. If you don't like it, oh, well. And it ended up, you know, in that case, that's what got him going and on his road is I talked to him like a man. Because you're right, there is a person in there. Yeah. And you if know, you want to bring out that best, you've got to kind of reach down and bring it back. But what's funny is I, I go back to that word respect, and I'm going to sound like I'm culturally appropriating for a minute, but I, I don't mean to. When I lived in Chicago, uh, I was on staff at about nine different psychiatric hospitals. So, oh, oh, not, well, first of all, my condolences for having to live in Chicago. Oh, but I was there at a good time. I was there. <laughs> the food was uh, The weather was horrible, as you can imagine. Um, but the food was completely awesome. And it was back when the Bears won uh, and when we had uh, the Bulls for basketball. So, oh, are you talking about in the Jim McMahon days? Yes, these were the good days. So, uh, anyway. Really? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to talk football with you because I'm going to get smacked down for sure. But but it was a lot of fun. So hey, I'm a Cowboys fan. We haven't won anything in 25 years. So you're don't worry. Well, my my Cubs finally won a little while ago. So uh, and even the Blackhawks have done okay. So anyhow, I, I had the good fortune of traveling down to Jamaica because that would be a place we would go for vacation. It was very popular. You know, people in here go to Hawaii. People in California go down to to Mexico. 
we would get to go to Jamaica. I absolutely fell in love with Jamaicans. Um, they are people that are out of this world. Um, there's not a Jamaican I've met that, that I haven't got something I like about them. Well, um, Doc, they live in paradise. Well, but but the people, yeah, that too. <laughs> the people, and, they, and they eat some awesome food, patties. You, know, and, you ever had a uh, um, curry goat? Absolutely. One That's of my the, best friends in the Army was a Jamaican guy. And we were in Hawaii, Scofield Barracks. He's always taking me around the Jamaican community. Curry goat, goat great music. No, they're, they're great people. I loved it. Jer jerk chicken and patties. Oh, my and God, yeah. Stuff. yeah so. Oh, my God, and they feed you like like Asian grandmothers. Yes, yes. Just so, show up to a party, it's like, eat, eat, eat. It's like, right. I got a totally, pretty deep test. Totally love it. So, but they had, they had a greeting that they would give to one another. They'd shake hands and they would say respect. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, that's it. And so that for me is something that I've tried to continue to do wherever I can. Um, and I think it, it really makes a big difference because people are more, more likely to meet you halfway when that's going on. And so that goes back in part to where we started our conversation. We have been teaching responsibility. We haven't been teaching respect, respect for self, respect for others. These go hand in hand. Um, it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes perfect sense. So, Even the um, respect for parents. It's like I ordered a white gold and diamond necklace for my mom, right? I ordered it with a M and the diamonds, right? And so she gets it. She goes, what's this for? I'm like, mom. She goes, my name is Sally. <laughs> like, I've never called you by your first name. So my first instinct <laughs> was to order the M because we didn't, you know, you didn't do that. You didn't call your parents or your grandparents by their first names. Right. I remember my grandfather passed and I was surprised to learn his, his first name. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it, we didn't do that, but I, I think you're right. And it goes back to the, to the whole, and I knew we were in trouble a few years ago when I saw kids specifically calling parents by their first names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wish to God my daughter would ever call me Daniel. We got a problem. Right. Well, I think, you know, what we've been talking about tonight really is, the importance of um, some traditional values in the sense of honesty, hard work, respect, self-reliance, respect for self and others. Um, and, and fundamentally in that is just sort of an appreciation for simple things too. Um, being able to meet people halfway, having a good conversation, having time together that's valuable. Those, those are really meaningful. And you know, when we're, when we're stuck with this little thing and we're spending our time in this little world, and we're not relating to one another, we're, we're missing out on really what this journey is about. And I feel so pleased to have met so many wonderful people. I've learned so much from my patients. I've learned so much from the cases I've been in. Students I've taught, they've taught me. Um, people like yourself, it's just, that's what makes the journey worthwhile. And so I I'm, I'm feel very blessed for that. And I try to find ways to contribute and give back. Um, so that's, that, this is what's fun talking about this part, because I'd like to see these things reinstated. And I think what you're talking about is we've missed the boat in a lot of cultural issues, whether it be, and I'm going to, I've got friends that like rap music. I'm not a rap person. I like a little hip hop, but. I live but, in the country. Yeah, I'm a country guy. Totally. Okay. Um, but everything else. Give too. Me some so, straight. The problem is that there's been so much devaluation of people women in particular. There's been so much that's been done in terms of disrupting the family. I look back, if you look back at 1950s TV, shows like Father Knows Best, um, Leave it to Beaver, you're not going to see them dissing on dad. But if you go to most of the TV shows now, you go to the cartoons, dad is a buffoon. You know, Homer Simpson is, is sort of the, the ex example of what's held out. And I think the more we did to undermine parental authority, respect for one another, we have done more to damage that kind of a value system that is uh, fundamental to keeping a family system intact. Now, it doesn't have to be your everyday family that looks like it's a Leave it to Beaver family. Yours, you had your, your mama and your and aunties and others that were involved. Um, granddad was one step out. Yeah, that ain't the Leave it to Beaver household, but it's a family system that has the values, the shared responsibility, the commitment, the, and most important, the love um, and, and, and the respect. So 
uh, we've, we've messed that up with, with our music and with our TV and our educational system. I was on a liberal, if you can imagine, a liberal panel, because they wanted, uh, I'm a conservative. I wasn't always, strong union guy used to be really Democrat, and I don't equate Democrats and liberals as the same thing, but now with what's going on, I've become very conservative. So I was on their panel, and that was one of the things we were talking about, uh, was rap music. And if you look at it, it's destructive to any community it takes a hold of, not only the black community, but the, the white community. I was driving from the gun range the other day that we both go to, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear this loud rap music. I'm like, oh, okay, here comes a young black guy. No, it was two young white guys pulling up with the rap music. And it's like, oh, really? So in music, I think, is one of the things that changes culture. If you look back to the 60s and 70s, even the early 80s, where you had all these wonderful bands uh, that sung uplifting songs, you look, they really changed how people thought. And now when you have rap music, have you seen the WAP YouTube video? I don't think so. Oh my God. So I was seeing it trending on Facebook and they're like, oh, you gotta watch this, you gotta watch this. I'm like, what is it? And so I watch it and I'm like, that's one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know women could talk like that. That is, you know, in public, but it was one of the most ridiculous things. And, um. Like I was, uh, if you watched one of my earlier videos, my interview with Shannon from Real Talk Tarot, I was telling her I used to have all these diamond, I have a diamond watch that's in my safe, a Cadillac Escalade that's in the garage, but I wasn't happy. And so something happened, I forget what it was, but I was like, screw it, I'm going back to basics. And I went back to my cheap blue jeans from Walmart. Right. I went back to my old t-shirt, my old Expedition. And I'm happy. I'm happy because it's. I put value back on the things I care about. But no, what you're saying is right. You you didn't have a lot of those old shows disrespecting dad. No. Yeah, and I think I think that the dads actually, while there were some traditional family roles, and yeah, it wasn't perfect. Just like our policing system isn't perfect, our legal system isn't perfect. They sure beat a heck of a lot of the alternatives, and we could get into a lot more of that talk. But when we start taking things apart like that, the family system, respecting parents, um, respecting authority that's trying to set some limit, like respecting coaches, for instance, um, respecting the flag. I mean, I, I'm all in favor of dealing with improvements in how we deal with one another, um, understanding each other better. But when it gets to disrespecting the flag that people have fought and died for, we're here because you know, we take the benefits of that and we take it for granted. See, so, Doc, you just, you just touched on something. I was telling my nephew, uh, and it's funny, it's really a dichotomy, because I have one nephew who's all BLM, and I have another nephew who's getting his bachelor's and his master's because he wants to go into the CIA. It's really funny, but I was telling him, I was like, you don't realize, like for someone me, to me, what that flag means to me. I buried my best friend in the world under that flag and had to ride a plane with the flag because most people don't know every time that casket comes out, they drape it in the flag. Right. And when you have to fly from Fort Lewis, Washington to New Orleans with your best friend beneath you under that flag, yeah. and then you have to present his mother with that flag, it takes on a whole different meaning. And, and I kind of, it didn't really catch me at first with the whole Kaepernick thing, because I'm like, who cares? I don't care what Kaepernick thinks. He's an idiot. He's a small kid, right? But now that I'm seeing it in NBA and NFL, it's like I don't even want to watch anymore. Right. I don't right. even want to watch. That's why I think you should switch over to the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Jerry Jones is not going to go for it, Doc. Well, that's You're going to toe that line. You're going to stand with your hand over your heart. That's why I'm watching hockey. So my, my Blackhawks, they don't kneel on the ice. So it's okay. <laughs> oh, you know what I started watching? The Johnsonville Cornhole Championships. Oh, okay. Now we're talking. I should watch that. Yes. yes. You did too. It's kind of addictive to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, kind of it, addictive. I don't think people get it. But it's, it's certainly better than curling. You've ever watched curling? That's where they've got that, that, that lake like on the ice. I kind of like curling. I can imagine myself just going sweeping off the ice. 
I wanted to have them, you know, they got to have advertisers and sponsors. I think the best curling one would be a team sponsored by Mary Maids um, or, ah. or some of you know, Stanley Steam or Steam Cleaners and like that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, Doc. But yeah, no, you're right. And it's the, the disrespect for the flag. And people are saying, oh, well, Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we have all this, no matter where you go in the world, there's going to be social injustice. Yeah. Not everybody can be treated equally. Socialism has tried it for what hundreds of years now, and it's never worked. So let me ask you something. Okay. Because this, I was just reading, because like I said, I go through my news stories every morning, and I noticed something, a, a, a um, pattern. I want to be really careful saying this, but the Democrat Party, to me, I could be wrong, are pushing almost exactly the same policies that the Nazi Party pushed in 1938. Mm. And they're using the same tactics to push it. Now, I could be wrong, but when you said disrespecting the flag, that came to me. Wow. Well, I think I think you're onto something. You have to realize that the Nazi Party was actually the Democrat Socialist Party. That was the full name. And when you look at what we're talking about, what's going on right now? We're not watching the the um, Democratic Convention right now because we're having a nice conversation. <laughs> I wouldn't watch it anyway. I wouldn't either. And and like yourself, by the way, I was I grew up in a Democrat household. My granddad came from the Depression. He hated Herbert Hoover. He thought Hoover caused the Depression, and I don't think he knew really what he was saying. Um, I worked on George McGovern's campaign when I was in college. Um, I actually talked with George McGovern, so that goes way back. And then uh, and and I, I got to shake Ronald Reagan's hand, and not really appreciate it as much as I would do in retrospect. Um, but I got to see how the system being proposed by the Democrats, in my view, has always been one that has kept people in their place, has kept control, didn't put the money where it needed to go, and really didn't didn't give people a hand up. They were still trying to have handouts. Um, I'll tell you, I, I, part of my work as a psychologist, I worked in um, the projects and, in Champaign-Urbana, and we went to a household where these folks were living there and trying to help them improve their parenting skills. So I got a chance to really get in there and see what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And they weren't being helped. They, they were being given services, but they weren't being given a way to manage their own lives more effectively and have the opportunities then to use that. And yeah, there's there's been racism and stuff. Heck, my name's a Polish last name. I got dumped on when I was in California as a kid. Uh, had one of those strange last names. But, you know, that doesn't have to keep you down. It's when you find that there are others that are going to understand you and respect you and work with you to recognize that you bleed red just like I do. We're the same all the way through. We, we, we share so much in common. And now today we find out even more as we talk with each other. <laughs> that, that I just think that there's, there's so much more we can do. So I changed and became more of a conservative, mostly fiscal conservative, socially somewhat more middle of the road because people need to have different choices and all kinds of different people. But, but I think that that's what Ronald Reagan recognized in people. He recognized human value and he wanted to put that forward. So, you know, I tick people off. I try to keep my political views pretty much to myself because in my profession, it's not allowed. Um, and, I, and it's a shame because, uh, you know, trying to find a quote is difficult. They claim to be tolerant, but not when you have a different view. They don't even want to have a discussion. So now here we are in cancel culture, where if people disagree with you, you're canceled out. I'm sorry, that's not a discussion. You know that from our days in high school and debate. You had to learn how to present both sides. And, and we don't want people to do that now. We want them brainwashed into a, a narrative rather than truth. And, and that word narrative just, you know, shivers up my spine. So... Well, it goes back to the brown tactics of the Democratic Socialist Party of Germany. You know, yeah. stand in the back of the room, yell you down. If you don't say, well, if you say something we don't like, we're going to get rid of you. Yeah. And, and all that goes back to the same thing. Yeah, and it's, um, no, I, I'm with you on that. And that's just kind of where we are. 
I don't mind sharing my political views because it's like, yeah, what are you going to do? You're, you're going <laughs> well, to call, call my boss on the show and have me fired? No, he's not going to do that because he's me. But <laughs> but no, you're, 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 you're right. It's gotten to such a point, even with the council, the, the council culture, that I think now we're seeing uh, society start to fight back against the council culture. Yeah. And I think the person that started it really, uh, uh, one of the guys I look look up to when it comes to this whole Facebook and YouTube stuff, Joe Rogan. They tried oh, to cancel yeah. him. And he's like, screw you, I don't care. I'm sitting here drink my whiskey and smoke my weed. I don't care what you say. And he just kept going. And I think a lot of people said, oh, I didn't know that was possible. So, right. right, exactly. But, but yeah, if you're going to have dialogue, you have to listen to the other persons. Not only listen, you have to be able to willing or willing to accept what they're going to say. I was... Many years ago, when I was a very young man, I became a member of the Nation of Islam. Really? Okay. Oh, it was very short. So I was at a party, a military party. You know, we're all drinking. You know how GIs are. We're drinking. And I'm talking all my black stuff, right? And I had this older white dude. He was, matter of fact, he was only a few months from retirement. So he had already done his 20 something plus years, right? And he sits down and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, son, I don't agree with a word you just said, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And this was in 1993. To this day, him saying that has stuck with me. So when, now whenever I run across somebody I don't agree with, I tell them the same thing. Yeah. I don't agree with what you're saying, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that's the mark of a free society. And I would hope that that continues to be something that extends to all of us. Because, see, it, on the college campuses these days, they don't want a dialogue. Um, I can tell you there's jobs that I applied for and didn't get because I represented a different viewpoint than the narrative that they wanted to put forth. And, and they didn't want that discussion. Well, hey, that's not how we were trained. As I said, when we were doing debate in high school, you had to speak both sides, uh, pro and con, on the topic which allowed you to open your mind up and consider, you know, even in this other position, there may be some grains of truth and a perspective that might be worth considering. Um, when I do my work in family law, I have to look at a piece of information and consider a plausible rival hypothesis. What's another way that same information could be viewed differently? So it requires you to keep your mind open and don't conclude something until all the data is in. So there's well, a, I wonder there's a, if uh, debate should be more of a focus in high schools because that's one of the things, even in my personal life, it's one of the things I do. I have friends who are far left, friends who are far right. And I listen to all of them because I want all the information because I may not agree with my far right friends, but you might say something to where I'm like, huh, you know what? He's kind of right on that. And that has happened. My far left friends be like, huh, right. okay, I see where you're coming from. But I think it requires people to keep their mind open. But I think it goes back to what we were originally talking about when you have a generation of people who've been raised that they're always right, that they can do whatever they want. They're not going to open their minds up. So I'm thinking maybe this is a lost generation and we should ship them to Mars or something when the aliens show up. <laughs> well, my, my, my prayers go out that some of these changes that we're talking about at this level of values and communication and respect, my prayers go out that those changes can go forward because there are people that understand what we're talking about. There are those, even on the college campuses, that are spreading the knowledge that, hey, it's not just one perspective. In fact, a lot of times I heard a story the other day where um, one of the college students came in and talked to a bunch of other college students about the free market. And a couple college students came up afterwards and told them, hey, we've never heard any of this stuff here. This is new information for us. We were always told how bad and awful it is. So because there's been such a um, interference with open dialogue on the college campuses, such an inculcation of belief systems, indoctrination that was going on, that I'm hoping that when the eyes finally open up, there's a chance for more people to see exactly what we're talking about and realize that we are caring for them. Um, and want them to have an open mind and, and a society where open communication is allowed. Exactly. You know, and that's what the First Amendment goes to. So we're going to wrap up this episode of the Dan Dawson Show. I appreciate having you on, Dr. Redbicki. 
and there's going to be plenty more conversations. We've just scratched the surface.